Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to uh, the latest Systems Thinking Ontario on May 13th today. I believe it's Systems Thinking Ontario 121. Um, and on this session, we're going to title, What Can Systems Thinkers Learn from Civic Tech? So we're pretty excited about chatting about that. And if you don't know what Civic Tech is, that's okay. That's all good. Um, in true um, System Thinking Ontario fashion, what I'll do is I'll just go through the virtual room. We're a small crew today, and I think that's fun. Um, and we could just introduce ourselves, just introduce our names and what brings you here today. So I'll go with Don. Don, I just, uh, you just have to hit on mute and then you can go. You're going to unmute me. <laughs> okay, my name is Don. I've been uh, interested in this and coming to this group, I guess, for quite a while. Um, I'm fairly regular, though not you know, I don't have a perfect attendance record, but um, I'm very interested in the subject and I'm interested in its application. Um, I'm very interested in how society looks at systems uh, and how the academic world looks at it because they seem to be, how should I put it, very committed in one sense and rather distant in another. And there's so many areas like that, but this is a really important one. And uh, anytime I can see an application that seems to have some legs, I I I want to take a look at that. Nice, very cool. Thanks for joining, Don. Okay. Uh, next up is Rose. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm new. I uh, met I met uh, David a couple of. Uh, I guess weeks ago, and uh, I attended a, a session that he was giving on another forum, and then he introduced me to Zaid, and here I am, <laughs> and I saw your post today, so I thought, okay, let's join. Um, I'm not an expert in any of this. I'm uh, one of those outsiders. Um, I'm a mm -hmm. retired public servant, so I know a lot about government, mm -hmm. but I've also worked with the not-for-profit sector and some linkages with the private sector and um, systems thinking. I just I just look at things big picture, and so mm -hmm. I, I'd like to uh, learn from you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Good to see you, Rose. And I think you might be more of an insider to this topic than you, you might realize. And we'll mm. we'll come back to that at the end. <laughs> mm. um, uh, next is uh, Elena Leonard. Uh, hi. Um... I've been banging around the systems field for quite a while, and I'm just looking forward to hearing the presentation tonight. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Um, next on my list is Rachel. Hi, I'm definitely an outsider as well. I just saw the event posted online and was interested in coming, checking it out, and, and learning something new. Cool. Thanks for being here. And uh, Tim. Hey there, uh, good to see folks. I've been participating in systems thinking for a, a number of years yeah. now, but but with a terrible attendance record that, that uh, <laughs> not compare to Dawn's by any means um, in recent years, for sure. So I have missed a lot in recent years, but um, always like and look for opportunities to, to reconnect and, and participate in these. Um, um, yeah, so I guess I guess uh, different background and engagements with subjects associated with systems thinking and systems, and and that generally, um, and uh, did did have some experience and in interactions with with subject matter around what I guess would be under the umbrella of civic tech a little bit in in some uh, attending some of the sessions uh, here in Toronto. Um, so, and, and have been curious for several years now about, about how these two things might, might, uh, contribute to, you know, beneficially to, to each other's, uh, objectives, results. Thanks. Awesome. Good to hear from you, Tim. Well, yeah, it has been a while and glad, glad you can make it out and I hope the topic is going to be of interest. Um, yeah, before I introduce the two, or I, I may not introduce them directly, but I'll introduce myself. My name is Zad Khan. I'm a graduate from the Strategic Foresight and Innovation Program. So that is how I came to System Thinking Ontario. Peter Jones um, was an active member, or still is, um, and he was the instructor at OCAD-U. And um, in terms of the topic, I've had some interactions with Civic Tech. I've been part of it uh, in and out as in a fluid type of way. 
but I'm also just curious as to connecting that from a systems perspective. And so, um, yeah, that's that's the topic today is what can systems thinkers learn from civic tech? And exploring that, uh, we have uh, both Dorothy Ang and Curtis McCord. Um, rather than reading the bios and introducing you both, Dorothy and Curtis, I'll, I'll use a prompt and then you can integrate your introductions into the response, which is, um, how did you come to this thing called civic tech? And yeah, what is your vantage point? How are you coming to this concept? Um, what was your introduction to it? How did you find your way in and how do you relate to it? Maybe we'll start there because as a teaser, I think you both are related to it, but you have very different, you know, Curtis, Curtis you might have a more observational role at times and Dorothy, you might be more upstream of it as well. So why don't we go with uh, Dorothy and then Curtis? Sure. Um, uh, nice to meet everybody. I'm Dorothy. Um, I, I, right now in my role, I am the CEO of Code for Canada. We are a national nonprofit uh, dedicated to improving life in Canada using technology, data, and design. Uh, we largely do that by partnering with uh, public benefit organizations. So that includes governments, it includes nonprofits, um, community groups. Uh, essentially working with these groups to kind of build their digital capacity to, uh, you know, deliver more modern user-centric responsive services that meet people where they're at. Um, yeah, I've, I've uh, really been passionate about civic tech for a long time. Uh, I think I fell into it um, by happenstance. It was um, I, in my early or throughout my whole career, but especially in the early days, I really like bounced around to different, um, experiences and professions. Uh, you know, mainly I studied like engineering and business. So very much on track for like a very like analytical career <laughs> in engineering or business. Um, and so kind of have that kind of baseline of, of like, kind of approaching problems in a very analytical way based on a lot of assumptions that engineers are very famous for. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then I kind of got immersed into um, coming out of university, like my undergrad, I was, uh, I had studied materials engineering in Hamilton at McMaster University. So pretty much that whole area is like, if you go into materials engineering, you're destined to work at like a steel mill in Hamilton. Um, but, uh, right when I was graduating, uh, it was the 2008, um, uh, recession and all the automakers tanked. And so all the steel mills crashed. And so everybody had like zero jobs. We were like, Oh no, what do we do? And like half the people went to go like get their masters in materials. Half the people went to like get an MBA. A lot of people just like pivoted. Um, and I'm like, apply, apply any job. <laughs> I'll take it. And I, I end up getting this job with Accenture, which I have no idea what this group is, but, you know, um, for those of you familiar with like the consulting space, they're like one of the big four consultants. Um, and I uh, get this job doing like um, systems integration. So like, it's kind of like software um, design and delivery, but kind of between IT systems. And I have no idea what, what this work is, but I'm like, whatever, <laughs> it's a job. And it was like definitely a grueling job because it's in consulting. So you work like long hours and, you know, you don't see the light of day. And that's just like, that's the way it is. <laughs> it's like, all right. And it was um, the, the I, I got thrown into one of the big projects um, in my office at the time was with the Presto Fair Card system. So they worked with Metrolinx. They Accenture designed the entire system um, that is the Presto Fair Card. So for those of you, uh, actually, it's it's pretty much ubiquitous I think, across Ontario now. Like they have it in Ottawa, it's in you know York Region, it's in all the most jurisdictions, um, at least in you know where there's public transit. And um, uh, yeah, I'm like working on this this system, and and in the early days, like when it was first launched, and I was started getting immediately realized like it was pretty frustrating working on this because there was no. Um, we, we would have to like translate all these requirements, right? And like make sure that they were being tested and implemented against. But none of the requirements had anything to do with like the rider or like the rider's perspective. It was always like the transit agency must must get this much money and they must get this much fare and this much. And I was like, well, that's odd. <laughs> it's like a rider-based service. 
And then I knew for sure something was up because like I would go to, I remember I would go to like dinner parties and immediately people would be like, um, you worked on Presto? Like that thing sucks. I'd be like, oh God, that's so embarrassing. So anyways, um, that I think that moment, those moments really began my career in civic tech because I knew that there had to be, we, we all know the potential of technology and it's, it's power to do good. Um, but when it's uh, when it's designed and developed in a way that doesn't bring others along, it doesn't like engage community, it doesn't like seek feedback. It just like um, honestly, it just leads to like shittier services, <laughs> just, and, like and people who are just really frustrated. Um, and so I knew from then on, like you know, I I did a lot of reading, learned about the civic tech space. At the time, Code for America was um, was just kind of starting, and they they had formed uh, their Code for America brigade. So these are like volunteer groups of like technologists during the day who have like full time jobs who come together in the evening to just work on um, you know challenging problems in 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 the evening at these hack nights. And I had met uh, just some a group of people who were also passionate about civic tech, and we were like, you know what, let's start our own kind of Code for America brigade and join that network, but based in Toronto. Um, so it was part of the founding group that founded Civic Tech Toronto. It's a fairly large meetup now um, that still runs Hack Night. So every Tuesday, you know, people come together, they work on like civic tech projects. They just have conversations about the role of technology in, you know, benefiting the public. And it's a very contentious topic. Like, especially back then, it was like, you know, we were talking about, probably cybersecurity was the most contentious thing. Now, like fast forward, it's like, you know, cybersecurity is still <laughs> super, super hot topic. Like now you've got AI, now you've got like generative AI, you've got like, there's just so many more ethical concerns with like technology um, as it keeps like progressing at an exponential pace. So yeah, I think it's, it's a very interesting place to be and it's a good um, area to ask these like important questions of like, what does like responsible AI look like? What is like, why is data governance important? And why do we all need to like, why is it important to share data and like, you know, have governance structures that enable different groups to coordinate and collaborate and things like that. So yeah, that's my little, a bit of a long story. <laughs> That's wonderful. No, thank you for sharing from Accenture to Presto to, to Civic Tech and beyond. That's that's amazing. Um, yeah, Curtis, why don't you share how you kind of got into this space and your relationship to Civic Tech? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Actually, Dorothy, you're taking me back to like 2015 when I started to get involved with Civic Tech. Um, I remember the conversation back then was a lot about like urban mobility and open data and people were interested in how cities were going to change because things were becoming more integrated. People were becoming concerned that like governments didn't know how to kind of wrangle with these changes that they were maybe less equipped than they needed to be. But at the same time, you had all these people who were starting to recognize that uh, you know, maybe we could do something. Maybe if the governments were more open, maybe if their technologies were more, their technologies, their data were more open to participation, to contribution, to hacking, et cetera, maybe we can make something really interesting happen. Um, so it was a, a friend of mine, Matthew Gray, who uh, took me to- uh, Oh, I, to and I actually met Matt, I worked with Matthew at Presto. That was the funny thing. That yes, I, I, I do. Yeah, he did work at Presto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. yeah late, later- uh, uh, so I, I remember going to one of the first Civic Tech Hack Nights and being like, this is pretty cool. Um, you know, that everybody was very nice. It was a welcome community. I did, I was around Civic Tech probably a lot more in 2016, 17. And then um, and I started to get this idea as I got more and more into my PhD research that like, you know, this is a very interesting group. What they're doing here is a very interesting thing. I thought, you know, because I had read a lot about Code for America and the movement there. And I thought to myself, you know, this is a very different kind of movement. This is a very different kind of group, a very different kind of organization than uh, than people tell me is, you know, existing in, in uh, the United States. And I thought, well, somebody should really study this. Somebody should really, you know, try and, try and document what's going on here. Um, so I did that between, um, I think, let's say 2018 to 2022. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Civic Tech. It's not my first time at a Systems Thinking Ontario uh, meetup either. Actually, I remember I went to see an excellent presentation on uh, 
Christopher Alexander um, and design patterns, which probably would have been also around 2018, 19, because part of what I wanted to do in my research was show how civic tech operated with these kind of overlapping networks that brought different kinds of people together to talk about similar issues and how it kind of acted as a host space or a platform for different kinds of publics to to come together. Awesome. Do you want to do you want to share a little bit, Curtis, about even even the latest point as your your PhD and how that touched on uh, the civic tech as well? Yeah, so I was just very interested. I was interested in a lot of things about civic tech and because I found a lot of things really interesting. Um, I became especially interested in civic tech because of the way it operated as this kind of like boundary space, I, uh, to use the kind of academic terminology, because of the way, especially I thought it was the most interesting, one of, well, not the most, maybe one of the most interesting, because I don't want to pick favorites. One of the most interesting parts of it, civic tech was, was how it, in my opinion, created a space where civil servants, public servants, interacted directly with the publics that they were serving. And I did not see a lot of this happening. I became very interested because rather than working indirectly through indir uh, through elected representatives, civic tech was a space where the publics that were being served by government policies or programs or et cetera, were put in direct dialogue with uh, public servants who were kind of either on the clock or off the clock or looking for different things at different times. But I became very interested in this because it was not a formal space. It wasn't like a formal public consultation. I participated in a lot of public consultations during my research as well, because I was interested in how those work. I remember I got my start being interested in systems like budget talks, um, throwback, rest in peace budget talks. Uh, um, yeah, they, they got rid of that one when the government changed immediately. First thing to go, budget talks, done. No more participatory budgeting. Um, and I remember becoming really interested in how people could kind of set the agenda at Civic Tech, how it was kind of like more of a commons, a community space and a resource that people could draw on um, and how they could work with each other and kind of advance their understandings, but also try to get things done and even influence um, influence policy and stuff like this. Awesome. Yeah, if I can add on that, that is absolutely like one of the um, hidden gems <laughs> civic tech that like no one ever would have predicted um but it, it's how code for canada was born like so many great things have come out of those interactions between public servants and people who like have like understand technology or care to understand technology and just are open to like talking um and uh yeah like that that what like the one obviously the big um uh, outcome that that I love is that uh, as working at Code for Canada is that we Code for Canada was literally born out of a conversation between folks from the Ontario government who had shown up. They, I believe, Matthew Gray was probably one of them, um, uh, having conversations with some of the organizing group at Civic Tech Toronto. And I remember one of their comments was like, "What." people are working on projects for free <laughs> like what is this they were like can we make this more official and we were like yeah like you know there's this group called code for america in the u.s we could start a code for canada in canada um and they were like well like okay then that then that kind of started the whole conversation uh, with the ontario government and they ended up uh giving us a grant for to actually like start the formally start the organization um but yeah like i i think um if we like zoom into like what makes those interactions really um, valuable for, for all sides. I think like, like Civic Tech Toronto has done a very great job of like creating this, like a safe space for dialogue. So it's like, there's like a very strict like code of conduct. Um, you know, they're, they're very inviting to, to anyone in the public. Like they're very good at like, operating in the open and talking about their work and you know so people are like who are not sure about what what happens like you can watch any one of the youtube videos or like read any one of the blog posts um and they uh yeah there's like so, that, so there's like a space space so it's like dialogue um can happen there as like a, a foundation and the, the other thing is like it's facilitated in a very um uh not it's like a kind of a strict way but not overly strict so there's always like 
you know, a showcase of a project and then kind of there's like breakout rooms that you can choose a topic and go chat. And, um, and it's, uh, there's always like an onboarding, like a one-on-one class for, for new joiners. So, um, everybody kind of feels welcome, I, I find. Um, and then the other thing I think that is important for public servants who show up is like the ability for, from what I've now having worked at Cobra Canada, having spoken to so many public servants, um, what I hear a lot is that it's hard for them to access like modern tech talent. Um, like there, there's a lot of like IT talent in, in the public service um, and their val their skills and experience is incredibly knowledgeable. But there's something about um, because the public sector really struggles to like attract, um, you know, modern uh, technologists. So those folks who are like, you know, more working in the private sector, working on like modern, um, more emerging technologies. Um, when when Civic Tech Toronto creates that space for like, you know, just a regular public servant to be like ask questions that they wouldn't ever be able to ask of, like, some of their own coworkers. Um, so those are the, some of the, I like really Curtis, when you mentioned that, like I immediately was like, oh yeah, like I remember so many great conversations coming out of like just simple interactions <laughs> that I, I think like I totally took for granted at the time. Yeah. I, th I think it's really interesting. You both touch on like the, the benefit of having this gravitational, you know, pull in, in, in a shared space between public servants and actual pu civically engaged public and what potential that can lead to, especially one that is started organically. And, and I think that's really compelling. I know we use the term civic tech a lot and, and just some folks on this call may or may not have different degrees of familiarity, but, and I know there's often debate in defining the term, but I was just wondering like Curtis and Dorothy or both, could you maybe share a little bit about unpacking the breadth of what encompasses in civic tech? So Dorothy, you just mentioned this rare chance where public servants get to engage with an interested public what breadth does that start to encompass? What shapes and forms does that start to take on? Curious, you want to start? In terms of, I mean, civic tech, part of its, I think, utility and its resilience and its is its flexibility is the fact that it is, as Dorothy mentioned it's like there's parts of it that are strict, but then other parts of it that are almost shock, dizzyingly loose and flexible. Um, so depending on what you want to get out of civic tech, if other people can pro can provide it, if they are willing to provide it, you can you can get it. So people would work on all sorts of different projects that either directly, like, for example, some of the early projects at Civic Tech were like, let's build a, let's build the front end to access a government database that is incredibly difficult to search through. Let's build a web crawler that scrapes through, um, through hand serds or, and becomes easy. So it becomes easier to search through them. Um, so these were capacities that government, like, you know, not only it's their duty, but at the same time, it was much quicker for people who had the, this tech expertise to just whip up. Like Dorothy, like there were so many instances where people with like tech expertise could just kind of provide like an like something immediately. They're like, actually, you know, what you've described as a problem is not a problem for me. Like, you know, we can do this quite quickly. We can, you know, integrate some data. We can do some visualizations. We can make a front end for for, for a database or something like that. Um, so there are these kinds of projects that built on top of government infrastructure. There were additional kind of like para-governmental stuff. Like I remember like mydemocracy.ca and stuff. Those projects were working around um, Budgetpedia that were kind of commenting on and kind of helping people to understand government uh, and like kind of empower, like literally in the case of my democracy to empower them to run for public office and stuff like that. There were projects that weren't focused at government at all. There was like, you know, uh, Toronto Mesh is one of my personal favorites. Like this is a, like a, a kind of alternative infrastructure project. Um, there was transit. There was a place for people to come and like really, I think what I, what I write about is that Civic Tech Toronto operates as this kind of place where people can come and act in in the role of of the citizen in a way that 
they don't, there are no very few opportunities for people to perform in that way. Either you're a citizen when you're going to the polls, you're a citizen when you're receiving a government service, you're a citizen if you're kind of taking, um, you know, taking some kind of action with, with your, with your fellows. Um, but this is a kind of, this is a looser place. This is in some ways closer to like a forum where you can come and show this is, you know, cause we often talk about how it's like, it's technology applied to matters of public concern. So to issues or topics that affect many people in the community and perhaps they want to do something about it, or maybe they just want to talk about it and learn more about it. But it's a place where they can come and discuss in this civic modality, where they can act as if they're, you know, full-fledged democratic citizens. And and like to um, further like elaborate on the potential of civic tech, the the part of um, the part that of that network or the projects um, that civic tech you know, uh, contains in its, in its ecosystem. Um, part of what is the beauty of like why they, why they're able to accomplish so much is because um, a lot of the principles of civic tech projects and civic tech communities are really kind of like uh, very, very closely coupled with like kind of just the agile, you know, delivery principles of like, um, for those of you that are, familiar with like project management and know of there's um there's different like project management approaches and in the more uh like i don't know maybe in the last like three decades or something um there was a group that kind of started a new a more modern iterative uh responsive um methodology called agile methodology um that that yes has a bunch of processes like if if you're if you know about like scrum and sprints and all those things but really what is important about agile is it, it comes down to um like some key principles of like you know it's about people over process it's about um i don't even know all of them it's anyways they're they're all like it's based on principles of like um and you know, let's not, yeah, problems. like, yes, exactly. Like being open versus not open. Like, let's, let's talk about our work. Let's share our work. If we hear of another group that is um, trying to do a similar uh, initiative, but with like a different, maybe in a different problem space, maybe, you know, one group's tackling food insecurity. Another group wants to work on budget plan, um, understanding the municipal budget. Um, but they both kind of rely on the same technology concepts why reinvent the wheel? Like fork, you can fork the code, you know, hand, send it over to that group and they can progress um, a lot quicker. And it's ultimately all about action, right? Like that's the the beauty of civic tech is that I think a lot of folks, um, this was this was for me personally too. Um, you know, I've done a lot of kind of civic engagement work in where I live in Toronto. And there's a lot of group, I found there's a lot of groups that, are really great at talking like they talk a lot about the issues and understand the issues which is which is great um uh the challenge is that um really you kind of don't you can't really understand an issue um further if you don't actually like prototype something and put it in the hands of the people who it's going to affect or who the users are or the end the end user um, and see how they react right like maybe they're going to love it they're probably going to hate it. <laughs> like at least what that does is it creates a cycle of engagement um, that then informs the next iteration of like, okay, what did we learn out of that? Like now let's you know deliver on on that next thing and deliver it back and see how people react. Um, and it's so it's that it's that um, process for continuous improvement that like um, really like you see that in a lot of civic tech projects and there's no like they just kind of naturally um have have accomplished like some pretty incredible things even though some of them you know a number of them eventually fizzle out um mm -hmm. i think more from either the problem has changed or people get you know tired or other commitments or whatever but um yeah. but there's there's a lot of learnings that come out of every project yeah yeah i think the value sorry go ahead curtis oh please up to you no go ahead i was just gonna Okay, one of the things I actually like I thought was most important when I was doing my research was I never wanted to talk about projects in terms of 
success or failure or do they deliver a product do they you know achieve their goals because you know to me not only was that ultimately to me that wasn't the goal it wasn't necessary like if you built something very good that's excellent you know of course but it didn't need the that didn't need to happen for what happened at civic tech to be incredibly rewarding for everyone who participated in it. And part of that is just because as Dorothy mentioned, this is this an iterative and open approach to something. So you could come in and your goal could just be to learn about an issue and you can learn by doing, you can talk to people who already know about it. Even, you know, everybody who participated in a project could get something out of it, whether or not at the end of the day, you ended up making, you know, a killer app or yeah, it just eventually fizzled out. And what's left is just open source code on GitHub, which in a lot of cases is still a, con a, con a good contribution. Um, and that kind of like that learning and experimentation, I, I, your point about agile, I think is, you know, it's an important cultural, like kind of um, important part of the cultural context around civic tech too, because it is really kind of like the way, the way that, week to week, people could come in and touch base and kind of be like, okay, this is what we're going to do. We have to bring new people in. You know, we have to see what we need to do one day to the next. And over time you have people, you know, I think of um, the transit uh, project is a great example of something that's just like this accretion of knowledge and, and, and work and expertise over the years that becomes like a pretty sophisticated and elegant, like kind of, um, kind of system for understanding when the next, um, when the next um, streetcar or bus or subway will come. Um, and part of that's because you have this mix of different expertises and people coming in, right? Like the, the bread, like, so when you look at the people who compose, say the initial, um, the initial founding members of civic tech, you have um, civil servants, you have technologists, you have consultants, engineers, programmers, like you, and, activists members of the public people involved in nonprofits, like and then throughout the years you have students artists um all sorts of like all sorts of different people like who come in and they participate and they contribute in whatever way that they they see fit and understanding and reconciling some of these different perspectives and different different expertises is part of i think what gave it a lot of its like well gave it some of its you know uh appeal hmm. yeah i love that the value the value of learning as 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 a kind of a mode of looking at it rather than success or rather than like what it what it came to do and, and the type of people that that invites i just want to pause here just to bring in you know the, those on the call here if there's any you know we talked a lot about getting some grasp of what civic tech is and is and is not and it's its ability to bring people together, public servants and the active public as well and learning opportunities. Are there any questions, thought, reflections, uh, interest interest that anyone has? Uh, we're a small group, so feel free to unmute and share and we can ch chat from there. I could start if you like. Um, so great, uh, I'm, I'm so curious about this and lots of things going through my head. Um, so I, you know, as a former public servant, just a, person that's interested in people. Um, I'm always concerned about the digital divide. Um, so those, you know, I, I really like the process and I, I agree that it's the learning that's actually the most important because you never know what the next thing's gonna be, right? So those that you can't reach. So, um, you know, the most vulnerable in our society, you talked about the transit app or the transit, you know, if I don't know, I don't have the stats, but who actually takes the bus or the transit? It's not the billionaires or the millionaires or the, uh, you know, it's those that have to go day to day work um, and are, you know, really hand to mouth existence kind of thing. And, you know, how, how do you reach those people? So do you have any examples around that? Well, Dorothy, I mean, I'll, oh, okay. I can toss this to you because we can talk. There's certain projects like Shalmer's Card, um, Shalmer's Bot, and these were people, um, some of whom had experienced like precarious situations and homelessness and stuff like that in Toronto. And they were interested in seeing how technology could be applied to their situations. Um, 
And so one of the things that they created was like this laser cut card of resources um, that like could be passed around. They, the, the key here being that it was, they were creating a, a durable object because they said, you know, people in these situations, like you, you get wet, you get, um, you know, things happen, but this durable object will stay with you. Next was a, a chat bot that would help people access services that became Chalmers bot. Um, that was built on top of IBM Watson, um, I believe. Uh, then there was um, the Chalmers signal, which uh, didn't never was never officially adopted, but that was an attempt to kind of uh, get a better signaling system for what shelters had space available because it was hard to know, you know, if you go to a shelter, you're like, oh, I need a place to stay, they're full, where's the other, yeah. who's, you know, where is it available? There was, there's of course always difficulty integrating with these kind of wider systems. I think one of the persistent challenges though that Civic Tech always had was exactly, as you said, reaching, like reaching those who are, like, who are adversely affected by, by like the social, our social and economic arrangements. Um, like one of the, there's a number of reasons for this. I mean, one, it's a Tuesday night, it's downtown, you know, a lot of people are working nine to five downtown. They're the ones who come to civic tech. We were never able to, to really broaden that outside of downtown. It changed a little bit when things went virtual, but I'd always thought that was one of the kind of like, one of the major barriers was kind of like, trying to mobilize that because like civic so tech is again it's an organization run by volunteers doing the work of getting people who fall through the cracks is like it's an enormous amount of work right so it's 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 not something that i felt you know i didn't it, it wasn't something that was easy to do especially when like you're mainly focused on simply reproducing what you're already doing through these weekly hack nights um, but it was definitely something that people thought about and wondered about um, I think actually Dorothy could speak to one of, I think, a, an interesting example of that, which I think would be grit. Um, so why don't you tell us about grit? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and I didn't, I hadn't, I remember Chalmers bot. I like didn't, it didn't come to my mind right when, uh, so I, I appreciate you, uh, bringing that up, Curtis. Um, yeah. And interestingly, so Chalmers bot, this was a, uh, the two founders, one was like a designer, one was a software developer, I believe. They were showing up at the Civic Tech Hack Nights using that as a space to kind of like progress their work. And I believe actually it was through that work that they actually um, managed to, uh, like they had full-time jobs in in at a tech company. They kind of like managed to be able to quit and like move over to this uh, venture uh, full time with with some funding, so they they were able to like use the community there to like gain that momentum to then, you know, put all their energy behind it as as a full time job. Um, and I bring that up because yeah, so one of the um uh, this this uh case study that we're talking about was actually at the same time as Code for Canada was kind of we were already a nonprofit and we were kind of growing, and at uh, a specific time, it was actually like 2018, 2019 or 2018. Um, for those of you in Toronto who are familiar with Sidewalk Labs, that was the group, um, you know, under the uh, Google Google parent company Alphabet <laughs> that had won the proposal to uh, redevelop the Keyside um, area in, in the city of Toronto. And there was a lot of discussion around that because folks were like, oh no, surveillance technology, what's all this like smart city technology you're going to mean for us? And is it going to collect data on us? And just like, then Google's going to monetize it and like sell it to another city. Um, anyways, um, we at Cover Canada, we'd actually uh, uh, had been speaking to the folks at Sidewalk Labs to say, hey, um, everybody's, you know, kind of freaking out about <laughs> These like surveillance, these potentially surveillance technologies that you're saying are not surveillance, but like, how do we know that? Like, it's Google, so like, we kind of can't trust you. Um, and they were like, they were like, okay, okay, like, what can we do? What, what, do, what do you think? And we we're like, you know what? Actually, a civic tech group in Chicago, because um, remember, as as we talked about earlier, Code for America in the U.S. oversaw like a whole bunch of brigades um, in in the U.S. 
uh, one of the ones in Chicago, they had started a few years back a group called a civic user testing group. So the acronym was CUT Group. And what they would do is they would recruit regular people from across every ward of the city of Chicago to give feedback on technology. So they would people would test their public facing technology with just like regular residents and residents would get paid. That was the most important part. They actually got compensated for their time, which is like super important, especially in the, the testing and like feedback um, space. Um, and so that model really took off in the US and a bunch of other jurisdictions like Miami and Portland, they, they started their own cut groups. Um, so we talked to Sidewalk here in Toronto saying, hey, we should start a civic user testing group in Toronto and they were into it. And so they, they kicked in some funding. And so we launched this inclusive user research and user testing service at Code for Canada, which we called GRIT, which stands for Gathering Residents to Improve Technology. Um, and this service is designed to essentially help decrease the digital divide. Because what happens is the digital divide is like one of these things that are it's like massive in our society and it's invisible at the same time. Um, and, and it's kind of just like getting worse and worse over time because if you think about the folks who are um, on one side of the divide that have maybe low like digital maturity or low access, it, like minimal uh, access to like digital infrastructure, like the actual basic needs to function in a digital world. And then you compare that to the folks who have, who are like way more advanced. And then you ask like, well, who's, who's accountable for making sure that that digital like social safety net is there. Um, often at the end of the day, it comes down to groups like governments or nonprofits. Um, and because those are the only groups that are really, that have, that are, that are accountable for delivering services to, to, you know, all, all people. Um, and then you kind of question, well, what is their familiarity of like digital concepts and like, you know, trustworthy technologies and, you know, operating in an open and transparent way. And often it's those groups where their um, digital maturity is actually quite low. Um, and so this is this is the challenge, right? Like, how do you address this divide that's getting larger where the maturity of the group that is like trying that is accountable for kind of like closing the gap has like such a low maturity? And there's probably there's like lots of lots of uh, <laughs> lots of approaches there to 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 like build up that digital capacity. But I think grit or these like civic civic user testing groups are one of the most effective ways to do that quickly. Because what you do is what these groups are designed to do is they seek the voices of folks who who often aren't ever um, asked to give feedback on on technology. Um, and so we, when in our grit service, we specifically look for like when we're when we're working with a government partner, and they're like, oh, we want to like relaunch this benefits tool or something, a benefits finder for, you know, name a population. We're gonna say like, okay, like we're gonna get a group of newcomers, we're gonna get a group of seniors, we're gonna get a group of um, people with who have some form of disability, um, and so by like targeting um, specific demographics and then creating again that safe space of like this um, government team is looking for feedback on this technology and you're going to get compensated and we're going to respect your privacy and you know security those are like really key things to bring those voices out right like um the the what we've heard a lot from governments in the past is like oh but we have public consultations and we have town halls and anyone can just like call in and show up. And it's like, yeah, but who's calling in and showing up? It's always the same people who have like, you know, that their time on their hands and like, or maybe they're like not shy and just want to, you know, don't mind <laughs> being that loud person again. But there's like a ton of people who don't feel comfortable um, showing up in those spaces. And so that's what the so the purpose of, of these user, civic user testing groups is to create that safe space for these people to come up. And what we've heard from um, government teams who actually work with us is they, they're they like, this is the most valuable feedback we've ever gotten. Like literally, like we had no idea that these things were or how people were, were perceiving our services. Um, and it's a lot of work because it's like, 
you know, now you think of like every, what contributes to the digital divide, it's everything, right? It's from infrastructure to like, you know, the way services are delivered. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, so it's, it's a lot of ground to cover, <laughs> but, but that, that's one, one approach that is grounded in civic tech roots. Mm -hmm. There's also, I mean, this is a little bit more outside, more civic tech more generally, but I think one of the one of the kind of things to come out of civic tech practice across North America, and I think also into South America, where there's interesting examples of people using kind of civic technology to kind of do community, like to do kind of bottom up community to organizing to create technology products like with residents to do asset mapping or to do um, design or even just to kind of to say do use data to kind of get their get their perspectives heard in a way with it where they present hard facts i mean there's groups in um in spain and the and the the uk the names the names slipping me right now but i'll i'll think about it in a minute um, there's work in Georgia, for example, where they took similar approaches to civic tech and combined them with a kind of like participatory design approach, combined them with this kind of, it's not public consultation, it's more like public co-design. So if you look at the work of like Chris Ledantic and Carl DeSalvo out of um, Georgia Tech, they're, they're getting residents to kind of contribute data experience and expertise as lived like ex seeing lived experience as expertise and the academics in this relationship are acting as a conduit between the residents and the um and the designers and the public servants who are in charge of like implementing say transit solutions or looking to build out say cycling infrastructure or something like this um so there's been a lot of kind of different approaches in different kinds of places um that kind of do more or less can better realize this kind of civic tech principle that's been around for a long time, which is, you know, building with, not for, um, and this kind of idea of like meeting people where they are. Although I have to say like, those are some of the hardest uh, goals to realize. Yeah. Excellent question, Rose. And I think kind of hits on some of the, some of the challenges that as Curtis mentioned that the movement, you know, still works on and holds in high high value, high principle. Um, any other questions from, from the audience or thoughts or reflections that you wanna share so far? Yeah, I have a couple. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm sort of torn here because in one sense, I think this is fascinating, the work that you're doing. And, and I think it's gonna to contribute to the, in the long run to civilization if we ever get there. The problem is, I think, that you don't, to begin with, you don't try to improve things that make no sense. Much of the structure of government, much of the procedural structure of government is crazy. It's all been added on to things that didn't make any sense to begin with. Nobody wants to go in there and tear these things apart and set up procedures that people can actually understand that don't just proceed to some sort of meaningless output. Okay? This this is across the public service. This is throughout the public. This is something that nonprofits, I'm sure, have to deal with every day too, right? So let's not uh, mess, fool around. I mean, this is not just a playground for people who have a nice hobby between the hours of six and 10 every evening or every so often, whatever. And by the way, I know a lot of people out there people who are not, as you say, digitally uh, educated or sophisticated or literate, who say, I don't really want to be, why aren't you doing your job instead of playing these silly games, right? And, you know, it's hard to deal with that because to a certain extent, they're not totally wrong. <clears throat> what we need is probably a, a book I was reading today, which kind of brought it home, although I thought the author was a little bit snobbish, what we need is not digital maturity, it's social maturity. We don't understand what policies ought to be all about. They aren't just to make things a little tidier, a little nicer, uh, to protect privilege. As long as we keep going down those paths, the governments we have in the world today, especially the democratic ones, but it doesn't stop there, 
are going to slowly crumble because nobody's going to be motivated to do much about things. Certainly nothing that is substantial or practical. And, and people are getting better at hiding the fact that they're just goofing around. No, they're getting very good at it. We have an entire educational system that is marvelous at that. Anyway, um, what else? The other thing is siloism is everywhere. I don't know what civic tech is. I never heard the term before I saw this on the site. And I thought I was reasonably well-educated in at least a general sense. And I still don't know what it is, by the way. Although I, you have been walking around the, the subject quite a bit. <clears throat> and it does sound like it could have promised something, but I'm not sure how it's going to do it if this is the vocabulary that's, that you use all the time. Okay. And so, frankly, what to conclude is democracy, governance in general, are in a sorry state right now. We have created a world where there's a lot of transparency, there's a lot of leakage, there's a lot of misinformation, there's a lot of, how should I put, useless information. There's a lot of do-it-yourself stuff that shouldn't be do-it-yourself. Somebody out there who you're paying should be doing it for you. So you can get on with something more meaningful in your life. Anyway, those are things that I believe that a lot of people would argue. I'm not necessarily in that position, but hey, I think you have to deal with that. Yeah, thank you, Don. And, and okay. maybe I can channel some of that. And for Dorothy and Curtis, I think one of those questions, I mean, I've seen it in the civic tech circles and other circles and is, is about who ought to be doing these roles and to what extent are we culpable in perpetuating some of the offshoring of some of that work? And that's a philosophical question that I imagine maybe Curtis you've observed or maybe Dorothy you you are actually directly entangled with. So maybe maybe you both can share some reflections on if that comes up and how you kind of navigate that. Curtis, you want to go first? Sure. So if you are talking about the one of the issues there that I think you're kind of getting at is responsabilization. So this idea right. that public administration is, you know, the hard work of like the hard work of, you know, actually doing things rather than just kind of shuffling papers or, you know, moving things around like that's being increasingly devolved to lower and lower levels so that services are delivered by non nonprofits, so that design is now being devolved to um, citizens um, rather than public servants, etc. I think you would be hard pressed to find contrib contributors at Civic Tech Toronto or many other Civic Tech groups that did not constantly chafe and constantly experience frustration at the at the kind of incumbent administrative and bureaucratic structures of government. I think I would invite you, I would counsel you, I would provide a normative statement. And I say you should go to Civic Tech Toronto tomorrow night between six and eight. And you if I you know I hope that if we meet again in another year, you've gone every week for a year. Uh, just to kind of see, you know, you'll learn what it is. I always I always avoid giving strict definitions. I was just actually trying to look as if, if I've given my own definition of civic tech at any point. And the best I can offer you is a kind of selection of different parts and different ways that people have described it in the literature. Um, because again, I see it as a practice. I see it as a practice that is challenging to the kind of hierarchical and closed nature of government. I see victories that we got there as kind of, you know, Civic tech is not a revolutionary movement. And I think that's worth bearing in mind. And to some extent, I would say that there is something bourgeois about civic tech. There is something liberal about civic tech. I have personally had to make the philosophical you know, commitment to saying, to, to, to not condemning it based on those critiques, because I still see it as producing value in way, in many different ways. 
even if it is within liberal politics, even if it is within bourgeois civil society. If it can break out of those, excellent, even better. Um, I think as far as challenging the structures of government, I think there are some pretty interesting examples. I would say that, you know, I do not think you can discount the role of Civic Tech Toronto even in the founding of the Ontario Digital Service, which was a change in the way that government delivered digital products, which was a major shift in the way that these services were offered to people and not in a way that was, so this was a way that they decided to start integrating these agile methodologies so that they thought, well, why do we have to sign out a $100 million contract to IBM, you know, uh, some consultancy, some tech firm? Why can't we, you know, have a team in house that can make a user public facing product with, you know, an open source library? And so the, the Ontario Digital Service, which started in 2016, whose founding members were founding members of Civic Tech Toronto, um, like, that was a major change in the way the government did its business. Now, whether it can, in, whether whether those practices can endure the kind of crystallization of like the kind of ossified bureaucratic structures that kind of we're forced to kind of deal with is another question. Um, I don't know that people in civic tech are interested in pulling them down themselves, but so you will be unsatisfied with my answer. Um, <laughs> yeah, no worries. Th thank you, Curtis. And, and uh, I know Tim's hand up, Tim, we'll, we'll do, we'll have Dorothy respond as well. Cause Dorothy, just to cue you up and for Don's sake, Dorothy, the work you do at Code for Canada is much more entangled with the actual workings of governments. And so you have a different vantage point of where responsibility is taken on and where it's shuffled out. Maybe you can speak to that vantage point that you have working further upstream. Yeah, yes, exactly. So, um, I mean, it's interesting because I think we're in a position where there's like, a lot, a lot of things that were said, like we feel, Donna, you're saying, like we feel all the time of just like the whole system is broken. <laughs> and and why, like what, what are we doing? Because honestly, to try and fix a system that is so broken, it is really exhausting. Like, like what, you know, like I don't want to burn out. <laughs> People I work with don't want to burn out, right? So it's like, why are we doing this? Um, and I think that, I, I think if you ask me these questions, like that question at various stages, like, so I've only been in this, in at this organization, Code for Canada has only been around for about seven or eight years. And likewise, Civic Tech Toronto also around for about, you know, like eight to 10 years ish. Um, so, you know, there's a certain like point in time of like, like what government was in power like um, it's largely a liberal government, at least at the federal level in uh, at the at the provincial level, like the Ontario government. Um, we didn't see the conservative government take over, I guess, like a couple of years ago now, four or five, four, eight years. Ago, I don't know. I guess it's been a while now. Um, and uh, it it is, you know, back then the uh, governments like. I, I guess with like, if we're talking about systems and like systems changing, government itself is like an organism that's kind of like expanding and contracting, right? And like that has to do with like the 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 party in power and like a lot of things. Um, and I'm I'm not a political. <laughs> I do not know the inner like really the mechanics of like you know policy and politics and bureaucracies. But I I'm more on the bureaucratic side, right? I see like like the kind of effects of how um, different parties in power affect the bureaucracy and, and their ability to deliver against its mandate and ultimately good services to, to residents. Um, and, and the back like, you know, eight to 10 years ago, as Curtis mentioned, like Civic Tech Toronto was starting, like there was a lot of interest at the Ontario government that was also around a time when the the liberal government was was just you know about to like lose their their position of power and i do think that there was some push to like 
as that, as like Kathleen Wynne was leaving, it was like, we got to do one last hurrah. <laughs> and so like, you know, dumped a bunch of budget on like this kind of like uh, th this work that is civic tech and code for Canada, uh, which was great, which was great for us. And um, from there, we saw this like uh, growing of like interest in digital across um, different governments in Canada and the U.S. as well. Like this is actually globally. There's a lot of kind of like government digital service teams that that uh, started that were actually already formed or starting to form. Um, now, you know, fast forward to now, it's the opposite, right? Like we're coming out of COVID, like governments are in have massive deficits. Um, at the federal level, there's like this eye on an election that's coming up and everybody's predicting that's going to go conservative. And so they're already feeling the winds of like, oh, the winds of change or they're already, they're happening. And you can kind of see uh, like the clamp, the, the, the um, if, if the, what I was just describing before with all these digital service teams, like was kind of going one way, this, the whole system's like swaying this way. Now they're coming back the other way, right? It's like the pendulum swinging in the opposite direction. So, you know, ODS, um, that Ontario Digital Service has now been kind of like sunsetted and like, you know, turned into this kind of corporate machine. And we're seeing the same thing at the federal level with the CDS and, and, um, uh, yeah, and like that's, I'd say that's also really heightened with the, you guys probably heard of the Arrive Can investigation that has had like pretty scarring effects on like government's ability to do anything really effectively. Like they've just gone full clampdown mode. So it's really the opposite of what, like before everybody was kind of open and interest, interested in exploring new ways of working, exploring, you know, showing up and talking to community members. Now it's like, no, nope. <laughs> don't say anything, like keep it shut, da, da, da. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it 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 kind of like um, speaks to, I mean, I guess it now it, it depends on each person's kind of view or ideology of like an effective government. But if at the end of the day, um, governments are about like, you know, great service, deli like delivering user-centric services to everyone in Canada, um, you know, like, um, that is, uh, that is essentially what the, you know, if you ask folks in civic tech communities, if they, if there's something they believe in, it's that, right. It's like, um, they, they do strongly believe in, well, this is the way, like, if we didn't have to, if, if government was doing this, like we wouldn't have to do this kind of thing is, uh, is a lot of what we talk about at, at Code for Canada. Um, but uh, but they but they they don't and they can't really like this comes back to how the system is broken like governments um, because we talk about well what what is required to deliver effective services and the kind of expectations of the public are just kind of increasing at an exponential rate with like modern technology evolving so quickly um, and governments are really struggling to keep up. And so really often their only option to keep up is to outsource it, right? They, they go with vendors and they don't know what they're buying and they don't know what they're spending their money on. And this is how you kind of lead to like more arrive cans happening, which then leads to further clampdowns. <laughs> so yeah, the, the kind of the, the way the systems are set up, what people are incentivized to do, how they act, um, and make decisions when it comes to developing public policies or procurement decisions. Um, it, it isn't in the best interest of the public. It's in the best interest of like, you know, how do we offload this budget now to make it look like we spent all our money and delivered against the thing that our, you know, party in power said we were going to do. And we can just like call it off and go to the next, <laughs> next election kind of thing. So, so yeah, Don, I think there's a lot of sympathy for that critical perspective you were sharing, which I think is valuable. And that tension is often held in, in those communities and circles. Did you want to add, you're on mute, Don? Uh, uh, Adding it up. There we are. To be honest, I don't exactly hold that position. But right. I, know plenty, I know lots of people who do, and I can sympathize with them to a certain extent because it's opaque to them. They don't see what, what's going on. Right. And in some of, if they saw some of the things that were going on, it would just make them angrier because they wouldn't see the purpose. They wouldn't see the bigger picture. 
Yeah. But, you know, I, a lot of people can't wait forever, right? Mm -hmm. I heard a, a terrible story today about what's happened since the government did a good thing. They brought in this new dental plan for for, for people who couldn't afford dentistry. The first mm -hmm. thing they discovered is people who have absolutely appalling dental conditions and mouth conditions and health conditions because they could never afford to go to a dentist. Yeah. So this should have been done a long, long time ago, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So instead of getting credit for it, they're going to get, you know, a, a dirty look. They're going to be told that they're they're not particularly positive. I can see yeah. the same thing with some of these things. And if you if people do make the step of getting involved in some of these processes, they're going to see just how bad things are. Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of the risk reward calibration that that movement has when you are acting in the open and transparent environment. And so it's part of the it's part of the is part of the calculus that I think that agile and open and transparent operation has. Yeah. Um, but before I know Elena, you have your hand up. Before I go to you, I know Tim had his hand up just a moment ago. Tim, do you still have a question or? Uh, yeah, something? just a comment. And you prefaced, uh, you you offered a fine preface to my comments because it is sort of uh, acknowledging, like as you say, everyone can sympathize, and I think in their intuitions and experiences, uh, can can see. The, the critique that, that Don sort of uh, you know, highlighted. So, uh, and everything everybody has said following that, I think, you know, it's a bit of a lament kind of thing. And yeah, it's probably all true. But where I come at this particular thing from is that any amount of what this is, is a good thing and a step forward because technology is moving so incredibly fast that everyone's getting left behind, not just the governments, but everybody. And um, for instance, when we were talking about... Um, people being left behind in the digital divide. And oftentimes that was couched in terms of economic uh, uh, stratifications and what have you. Um, you know, what comes to mind increasingly and, and uh, you know, uh, is, um, uh, you know, seniors or, or, or older different generations and their relationship with technology, right? And if, if you just dial up the speed on the evolution of technology, uh, where I may be helping my parents right now with some challenges they have around some email or some things that are unfamiliar increasingly, right? I mean, if you just turn the speed up, you can just back that age right back down. And like some grade 12 kid who graduates the year before the new high tech thing comes out, oh, their career's lost because, you know, in you know, it was that next cohort of grade 12s that 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 were born when chat GPT came out and now they have future careers. And that, you know, so I'm, I'm being obviously like uh, illustrating with an extreme uh, uh, kind of a thought experiment there, but um, it's not all that far off, A, B, and 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 so there's this, so, so the idea of civic tech seems to be embedded in a specific kind of configuration where there's fairly tight interaction or closer interaction and stewarding by, by a specific municipal or otherwise other government level, right? But there's other ways that people are engaging in these kinds of community-driven things right as well in different scenarios different constellations and all of them i think are really great because they're really just a foot in the door a thin edge of the wedge into some kind of broader participation um with a high variety you know i know that's going to ring in elena's ears a uh, high variety of participation that's equal to the task of dealing with the complexity of this onslaught this this fire hose of technology um you know, and so any foot in the door, any thin edge of the wedge of participation that exposes people to those things they might be upset by, Don, you know, that they, oh, I can't believe, what do you mean that's what we're doing, you know, or we, we should improve it this way, you know, whether it's that reaction or whether it's the learning or whether it's just the realization that you can participate in this way, uh, all of those are just the beginning, I think, of what 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 you know, broader participation will be required to to make this make sense in, as that we go forward in terms of governance and this kind of thing. So. Yeah, thank you, Tim. That was really well said, poetic even. Um, Curtis, <laughs> did you have your hand up? Do you wanted to add something to that? Yes, although I look forward to Elena's question, so I will attempt to be quite brief in my response. Um, I think one one useful corrective um, is that one thing that's important to know about civic tech, at least as it as it exists as a popular uh, venue, is that it is not stewarded by government. The stewards are members of the community. They may be public servants, but they are not acting in that capacity when they organize and when they put the time and the work in. The reason that civic tech continues to exist is not because 
any power has said it can continue to exist is because the community is continually leveraging itself as a resource to get venues, to get speakers, to get time, to get place, to get pizza money if they're lucky. Um, Civic Tech Toronto did one round of fundraising in, I think, 2016, 17. Um, and because their only outlay is for pizza, if they can't find a sponsor, that money, the small sum of money that they've accepted could sustain them for years without asking for contributions other than time and space and resource from its community members. The, to go just briefly back to Don's point, the flip side of responsabilization, and this is something that I've continually had to deal with conceptually, the flip side of responsabilization is participation. On the one hand, government saying, oh, you do this. On the other hand, it's you do this. Like you are, you are become a participant in the process whereby your policy, the policies, the rules, et cetera, that you live under are designed. Now, this is something that's common between agile methodology and some of my favorite systems thinking, which is critical systems thinking, is the belief and goes into political theory as well as the belief that people are, that are affected by systems should have a say, it should be involved in the decision-making about those systems. So while at the same time we think, oh, governments are failing because they are not properly administrating, Yes, that is true. But at the same time, the creation of different methods for people to contribute directly to the actual work of governance. And I will really, I will really downplay the role of elected representatives here because it's public servants who are writing the policies. It's public servants who are figuring out like what's real, what's not, what can be done, what can't be done. The interface between those two layers, I think is much more of a challenge to the existing paradigm of governance than, um, than it might be like initially thought. Yes, it's not, at, it doesn't happen at scale. Questions of scale are of course, extremely difficult. Um, yes, it's marginal. Yes, we still have to deal with the inertia and the inertia of uh, representative democracy. I'll say personally, I favor, you know, sortition and at least one house, um, which is governance by lot, uh, the random selection of representatives from the population. Uh, but I'll yield, Elena, please. Thanks, Carol. Uh, well, um, I am one of the people who is, has been pushing for uh, technologies of participation for a long time. And often governments don't want to hear from everybody and they don't want to provide enough time. Uh, Syntegration, the particular one I do, basically wants about three to three and a half days of people's time. Uh, hardly any government is willing to do that, even though it would save them a lot of time and trouble in the future if they were able to make that kind of investment. Because if you don't make that investment in time, you don't get a very complete picture and you don't get an opportunity for people to hash out among themselves, you know, what some of the considerations are and you know, sometimes what you have is you don't have opposition, you have essentially oblique positions, so they can get around. But, you know, sometimes what discourages me is that the most basic demographic planning uh, doesn't seem to have been in force. Um, the, um, the dentistry program was brought up. Apparently, they have a million people who qualify for the services, and they have 5,000 dentists who are willing to take those patients on. Um, it's the same sort of situation as bringing in a lot of refugees and having no housing for them. Um, you know, that, that kind of mismatch, um, you know, somehow, maybe they could fa have, should have phased in some of those things. But I think really um, the technology is really helpful. Um, but if you don't have government that's going to look at reality, it, you know, it's a lot more difficult. Dorothy, does some of that ring true for you and what you've seen? Yes. I mean, <laughs> the um, uh, one thing that I have. Uh, reflected on more recently in the last few years is that it's interesting when um, 
uh, you know, because I, I told you, like, my background is more of a technology or like an engineer, uh, you know, in training and government is like new, newer and foreign to me. And I'm just like, why this makes no sense <laughs> the way it works? Why does it work this way? Um, and uh, one thing that is becoming clear, especially in uh, the kind of life cycle of technology. So like um, a lot of in the in the large enterprise, like IT world, there's kind of like this term like project life cycle of like, you know, how does how does a project get kind of conceived in the beginning? Then how does it get planned? And then how does it, you know, how does that lead to the, the budget and how that budget gets assigned to the project? And then how does the project get implemented? Um, and in the life cycle, project life cycle of like, let's say a government service, let's call it the, the dental plan. Um, who, how did that how did what was the project life cycle, let's say, of the Canadian Dental Plan? And what often happens is these decisions start on the political side of government, right? Like uh, political campaigns, political parties promise these things. Those get handed over to a team of policymakers who develop the policies. Those folks make a um, they they do have you know they they they. Um, uh, definitely do research on like, you know, what do Canadians need, what what groups or populations need certain services, how it should get rolled out. Um, but what happens is, um, so I talked earlier about agile project methodology, the opposite of agile, because um, I also mentioned that agile is only about a few decades old, uh, or maybe less than that. I don't know actually how old agile is, but anyways, <laughs> maybe maybe 20 years old or something. Um, before that, uh, the the opposite um, project methodology is called waterfall. And so waterfall is, as you can imagine, it's just like a waterfall where essentially the work starts up here, planning happens up here, things, a bunch of plans get handed over to another team that execute against those, and those get handed over to another team that execute against those. And so you can imagine it's like, um, by the time you get to the bottom of the waterfall, um, if teams down here had learned anything in the implementation, they're like, oh, actually we rolled out this serve, this uh, Canadian dental plan. And actually we realized there's, there's not enough dentists that want to actually provide the service. Then what should happen, and this is where agile methodology comes in, is there should be a feedback loop going back to the people who planned it to say, hey, uh, by the way, you made these assumptions about the service, but you hadn't accounted for the fact that there's not enough dentists. And so you should iterate on that for your next policy that's that's going to come out so that we improve the service and i'm doing this circle because that's exactly what agile is it's just essentially a, a group makes some assumptions they launch this thing or a product they do that in order to learn with an audience or a or a user group and then they like recheck their assumptions like oh wait we were wrong on all these things now let's like improve it and government itself if you look at it at a high level of like you know, policy, like political side policy over the bureaucracy, the whole thing is just one giant waterfall. There is no, in in many governments, there is no feedback loop that goes from the bureaucracy back to policy. Um, if it is, I'm assuming it's like, I don't know, a 30 year life cycle or, or something. Um, and this is becoming a lot more uh, well known, especially with technology projects, because um, because we have these terminologies of describing different approaches to technology development, like agile and waterfall. And there is a really good book I can recommend that came out last year, written by the founder of Code for America. So she was um, uh, formerly like the chief technology officer in you know the working for like President Barack Obama knows very much about like kind of technology delivery and the ways the government systems are broken. Um, I can link folks here. It's an excellent read because I think it really does start to get at like, well, what, how come things just don't work in government the way we think they would work, like kind of the logical way. Um, anyway, so. Yeah, I don't have answers of like how to make it better, but I just know how it's like really broken. I think, I think Dorothy, you gave me kind of. I'm gonna, I'm gonna break character and break the fourth wall for a second, and and kind of participate in a way that's a little bit different. Um, even when conceiving of this, of this chat, what consists of things from learn from civic tech, 
I was actually thinking of it as civic tech lowercase, not proper noun. So that is to say civic tech as a concept. And what I'm, I guess I'm going to be sharing a, a reflection. I don't know if there's a question at the end of it. Um, and then I'll get back to my other character. But, but what I'm what I'm starting to observe, and Dorothy, you're hitting at this, and, and, and Curtis, you can maybe also chime in if there's any thoughts or reflections, that the start of a technology lens perspective on the downstream problems that citizens experience inevitably end up getting to higher levels of design. And I use the word design because I'm biased from a design perspective, so systemic design. And you start to think about concepts such as organization design policy design, stakeholder engagement design, and such and such, eventually they go so far upstream that it's fundamentally, uh, uh, you know, a question of, of like the fundamental policy and, 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 and the planning capacity. So what starts out as, and it's funny that Dorothy and Anchor were both saying that we've been in civic tech at certain points of our life, you know, or, or at a different decade. And later on, maybe as more years uh, accumulate, we start to see a perspective that what, what once started as enthusiasm for a tech-based solution ultimately ends up seeing it at a higher order of design, be it policy or systems or governance structures, et cetera. And that then becomes the new kind of um, un, you know, uh, ungraspable thing to try to wrestle with or try to do your best to handle. And that's where I think systemic design comes in. And again, I have some biases towards that. And and so I do see the value of civic tech as lowercase civic tech, even the concept of it of being being enthusiastic about directly engaging with the people you affect, being open, trying, experimenting, learning. But ultimately, when you want to affect the outcome, it starts to take on a higher order, which you have to accumulate more and more formats of responsibilities and engagement. So that's kind of the trend that I see. And I'm bridging that from Elena's comment. And Dorothy, you really you stated it really well is the feedback loop does not exist. And I think that is probably the biggest gap or one of the biggest gaps in that capacity of why things are fundamentally won't work. Even if you have the best solution, the best technology uh, layer, you won't, you won't be able to advance on addressing those issues so far. So as long as that you don't have the capacity to address how things are configured in the first place. That's my reflection, <laughs> yeah. Curtis. Yeah. That's a very good reflection. I, I, I do see the kind of there are challenges to this feedback loop and making this feedback loop right. Um, and I think that's one that kind of, you know, came up to me when I was 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 working on some like Connectio stuff. And you know, you have at the end of the day, you have decision makers involved in the system, and those decision makers are going to be elected representatives. And ultimately, they're not necessarily responsible for the delivery, the measurement, the benefits of the systems that they design. They are accountable to a different process that is not necessarily related to that. Now, there might be if the if the if the success or the failure is significantly catastrophic or, you know, excellent. It might be big enough that, you know, they lose an election or they win an election but the the structure of accountability is different so you don't you 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 have very little opportunity to kind of you know close that feedback loop one of the one of the interesting things that we can observe at civic tech toronto for example though is like a is a, is, is a feedback loop at a lower level in the design process in the working together of interested publics and the civil servants who are you know drafting policies making recommendations etc cetera, etc cetera. Their feedback ultimately is ultimately decision making is black boxed into the mind of an elected representative into the vote of a council a council member. Um, but before that happens, you have um, an opportunity to start growing like relationships that bring with them accountability that you know demand from people who are coming and presenting on behalf of power, demanding reasons, demanding justifications. Um, for for choices and decisions they're making. They, you know, I've seen uh, municipal public servants come to Civic Tech Toronto and present ideas and be challenged and come back and revise the, like, you know, revise them and float them in a way that is, you know, it's, it's, it's more like agile than it is like waterfall, right? 
Now, of course, the higher levels of the system and governance remain fundamentally broken and they'll be much more difficult to change because of course the only people with the power to change them are the people with the interest in keeping them the same um but nonetheless like the creation of these like relationships over time between publics and the people administering policies and stuff like that like that to me is still quite interesting i think you know as far as elena's comment about time and expertise involved in participatory governance you know, I, 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 I'm, you know, I've, I've always been a big fan of like deliberative polling and, you know, other exercises of, 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 you know, where, where people are, people are given the opportunity to like rise to the occasion of democratic governance, where they're given information, they're given the time and place to deliberate and scaffolding that it like takes a lot of work, you know. I have one of the papers in the dissertation that's that's linked is all about Sidewalk Toronto and about how even if you have a very robust process that looks like it's, you know, the, the scale of volunteers, the scale of consultations, the scale of discussion, the scale of information available to people can be very large. But at the same time, the the ground, the power that people actually have over the direction of the system remains very small mostly because power is guarded in strategic ways. There are people who kind of are connected to the civic tech movement that have challenged this and even in government. And I think, you know, Taiwan is a very great example to bring up here because, you know, one of the things that came out of the Taiwan, the Taiwan civic tech movement, where they occupied their parliament for several weeks, maybe, and started to hack on technologies and to bring transparency that they saw the leading parties as not offering, um, one of the things that led to was uh, was a political movement that was elected into power. And one of the things that they did was they created a position called participation officers. And these are officers that exist, public servants that exist in government, and their job is to facilitate like the, the uh, crowdsourcing um, or like scale deliberations at scale for their population to kind of gain information, you know, and one of the things I think that that's important or you you find some leverage with is that that involvement of people that are affected, that is actually like the antidote to some of the problems that we see Don is presenting, because that is where legitimacy is constructed. Legitimate involvement builds legitimacy because it builds trust and it builds relationships. So if you think you're in a democratic government, a government, you want to be able to see that you can play a role. You want to be treated as though you have agency. You want to understand why things happen the way that they do. And like, that's going to be done in relational spaces. It's not going to be done where you're hearing something happening on the radio and you have an opinion about it, which is, you know, how most of how I get my, most of my political life is me yelling at the radio, but that's not much of a public forum. Right. I take your point well, Curtis, about local form of feedback loops as being a high value interactive way for the average person. I think that's a, I think that's a good refreshing offset perspective you brought to that feedback loop before about localized and relational things. And then you've described a Taiwan example where that starts to accumulate in a more uh, seismic shift, so to speak. So I think your point is, is valid there. Um, yeah, I guess we're in the last few minutes here and we're, we're going to wind down. So I don't know if there's any other, um, any other thoughts or reflections or comments. I don't have to occupy too much time and we can. I think just to thank you, this has been really interesting. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Elena. Yeah, glad, glad you're appreciating that. Um, usually when we wind down, Dorothy and Curtis, we kind of come back to the headline question itself and we have a few minutes so you can feel free to elaborate or share any future aspirations. But we talked, funny enough, we just talked about feedback loops, which is a systems type of term. Um, and so this comes back to the headline question, um, you know, what can systems thinkers learn from civic tech? And I, I kind of leave that as the, the closing statements that maybe you both want to share. Curtis or Dorothy? Yeah, either, either of them. Um... Sure, like, I, yeah, I could start. Um, I think that uh, I'm not, well, I will preface by saying I'm not super familiar with system thinking concepts. Um, 
uh, in in detail, maybe or like to the to the point where I probably can't keep up in a regular conversation with all y'all. But I know enough to know like this space of you know where technology meets civic participation meets uh you know learning meets collaboration um all all of it that is civic tech is there's like so many systems at play that are almost always opposing each other <laughs> and and like to me ultimately that is what is preventing like us uh from having you know from from addressing all of these like pervasive societal issues of like you know the digital divide like uh, affordable housing in Canada, climate climate change in Canada, like all of these are merely um, areas or or you know concepts or discussions where people are not really on the same page, um, and a lot of it kind of comes down to why aren't they on the same page? Like why aren't we all looking at the same information? And that information is out there, right? Like there are governments working on these problems there are nonprofits working on these problems there's citizens working on these problems and what civic tech aims to do is like bring it all together right it's just like a, a, an avenue or a venue to um to like set up governance around actually like sharing the knowledge um that that's what it is so it's like that that um thing i mentioned earlier of like the strictness comes from uh, this governance of knowledge sharing and learning from each other. But then from there, the application of that data is like whatever communities think they need that data for to improve, you know, the lives of, of the communities that they want to improve. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, exciting um, systems thinking work, I think, in the civic tech space, because it's just naturally a place where kind of opposing systems that are designed not to work together um, end up, you know, reacting and creating like new things or kind of conditions for things to die really quickly. So it's, yeah, very, very fascinating. Wonderful. Thank you, Dorothy. Yeah, Curtis. Um, well, well, I guess my answer may not be maybe adjacent to the response to the question because I'll speak about it. I'd like to, to give my answer in terms of systems thinking. So it's not necessarily that we contribute, like that civic tech contributes something new to the advance of systems thinking, but provides an, uh, provides examples of principles from systems thinking that are extremely valuable and should like, and, 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 and ought to be, you know, more part of the mainstream. So I, I'm a fan of the work of, for example, Charles West Churchman and Churchman like myself is you know, I am a, I'm, I'm not a representationalist about systems, and I'm sorry if I'm going to get a bit, uh, you know, academic in my term terminology. I don't necessarily believe that you make systems that describe the world in a, in, in, in a correlative way. Systems represent worldviews. They represent ways that we've drawn boundaries around the world, and they can include or exclude different kinds of worldviews. Civic tech is a kind of place where different worldviews come and contribute and the whole goal of the endeavor is to come to a common understanding about a, about a system or to build a system based on a common understanding. This is a very difficult exercise, of course. But I think ultimately what it realizes is some of the moral imperatives of systems thinking, or at least in the critical systems thinking vein, the critical systems heuristics vein. So I, now I'm referring to the work of like Werner Ulrich, um, for example, who believes that there is an imperative to have people who are affected by a system involved as much as possible in the decision-making process about it. And I think civic tech is, is, a, is a practical instantiation of that in a way, because it is sent, Dorothy says venue um, or, or place. I think in fact, like we could even go further and call it a platform in the real sense in a, in, it is a programmable, um, flexible, extensible model to build a civic community. And this to me was always very important because I think the major issue that we face in democratic societies is that we do not often undergo political activity 
as members of a community. We are very, or we are often unaware of how we are interconnected or how we share stake in issues with each other in a way where we act together. Many people, of course, know this, but it is not like, you know, activism happens all the time. There are many different kinds of groups in different parts of politics, but it is not, I would say, a mainstream position in liberalism because liberalism is an atomizing ideology where people are consumers of service or they're voters or something, but they don't necessarily come together to act together. I think Civic Tech Toronto and Civic Tech groups in general is an experiment at like, it posits that community. It creates a space where those kind of communities can like, you know, stand up um, and, and, you know, seek support or try and gain ground. I think that to me is the kind of critical kernel that kind of is the kind of basis of civic tech in the popular sense. Um, so I guess, yes, that's my answer. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Curtis. That was very well said. Both thank you, Dorothy, as well. And, and honestly, thank you both for, for your time. It's been amazing. You've both been super generous with your time, thinking, expertise, knowledge. Um, even this conversation itself, it feels like we're kind of just getting started. Like if we were to continue this part two, Curtis, I could see us right away getting into the cultural phenomenons that then uh, fuse into civic tech civic tech in a different form like imagine that as kind of a follow-up so i'm already getting excited i think we should definitely find a way to continue the conversation um thank you again um for for those that are here or watching in the next few months we're actually going to be offline we do uh, almost a ritual in the summer months where we have the students from the sfi program at ocat share their synthesis maps so we're going to aim to do that in person uh, but if it needs to be a hybrid or virtual you may see that uh occur but yeah, thank you so much for Dor Dorothy and Curtis for your time. And thank you for everyone for being here. Um, yeah, have a wonderful rest of your evening. Take thank care, you everyone. all for your wonderful thank questions. You. This has been yes. an absolute pleasure. Great, great discussion. Awesome. Thank you. Glad you both enjoyed it. Take care, all. Until the next time. Bye.